going to be a very, very interesting discussion, hopefully. And I should say, I had the privilege of being on the very first panel and presenting the, on the very first panel on Russian elections, which was in some ways an existential panel because we were all wondering what's going to happen with the regime in Russia. And I have the privilege of being on the last panel, but which is equally existential in nature because we are kind of going to be unpacking uh, a complex mix of identity, ethno national, ethno religious loyalties, and historical memory. All of these questions are also ultimately very important uh, for understanding regime stability in Russia and also the security and the integrity of, of the Russian state itself. So um, I have the uh, pleasure of welcoming my the panelists. They, they don't need introductions. Each panelist will have 10 minutes to speak, and we'll start with Paul Good's presentation. This is, uh, what I'm presenting is a piece of culmination of a project that I've been doing for the last three years with funding uh, from Fulbright, looking at uh, everyday patriotism in Russia. And it actually started off being a study of like everyday nationalism, sort of nationalist quiet times, or what happens in between mobilizational cycles. Um, and then as soon as I got the grant, then Crimea happened, and it was no longer very quiet times. Um, and so I ended up focusing on patriotism instead, in part because it was suddenly much more prominent. Uh, it already had been building for some time in popular discourse and in government discourse, government rhetoric in Russia, uh, but really came to the fore um, uh, in a way uh, previously, I think, that hadn't been seen levels before uh, with the annexation of Crimea and before that with the Olympics of Sochi. Uh, just earlier this year, uh, Vladimir Putin even said that there is no other unifying idea uh, in Russia other than patriotism today. And this is coming you know, on the heels of after a few failed attempts for instance, things like sovereign democracy, which really did not resonate either with the public or with the elite. Um, and it's important to look at these things. I think if you think about the structure of the panels too here, the first panel that we had, uh, the uh, Tamila chair, focused very much on top-down politics, right? Elections, voting, what happens with the public, is largely treated as a matter of coercion or patronage or manipulation or what have you. And we know it works because it works. Um, I think we need to actually unpack a lot of what happens and look at things from a ground up perspective to understand whether or not this patriotic, patriotic fervor, this campaign actually is successful in generating support, if not legitimacy, for the regime as a going concern. Um, so, to give you an idea of the extent of, uh, of um, the state's investment in patriotism as a doctrine today, you can get some idea by looking at funding for the State Patriotic Education Program, uh, which has been in operation since 2001 and renewed every five years. And as you can see, it's increased steadily, it actually uh, nearly tripled in the most recent incarnation of it uh, as the state sort of moved in full force uh, behind patriotism as doctrine. Um, I should also add that these 
numbers here, this, these budgets are really just the tip of the iceberg. If you take into account the fact that uh, this is strictly from the region, or from the federal budget, uh, does not include discretionary funds used uh, by regional administrations or by local councils to fund patriotic initiatives or within individual ministries. So really, this is more sort of a broad general guideline at the scale of investment, but it's actually quite extensive. Now. Um, almost everybody that I've talked to um, also has noticed that in the last five years that patriotism has sort of become almost omnipresent um, in day-to-day -day life within Russia. Now, what is this state patriotism? What are the different elements of it? You can look at the program for the state patriotic education uh, program online, um, and then there's a variety of other sources. Um, and these all kind of can be synthesized in a variety of different ways. First and foremost, Official patriotism in Russia is really oriented around military patriotism. Obviously, 9th May, Victory Day figures prominently in this, but there is a heavy sort of continuity in the way that the Soviet Union also construed patriotism largely in militaristic fashion. Uh, a lot of this has to do with consolidating society then between or behind two key goals, state security and state development. And especially if you look at the early drafts of the patriotic education program, the heavy emphasis here was not just on consolidating society behind these goals, but specifically in preparing uh, citizens to be willing to serve the state for these, uh, for these purposes. Um, and so feeding people not just into the military, um, but also into civil service. Um, also fostering a sense of individual contribution, a direct individual responsibility for these goals, that every Russian should bear these um, as a personal, uh, as, as a personal uh, contribution to Russian history or culture. A significant part of this also, which is more or less off script, but also very public, is the idea that Russia is a place where you want to stay. So not going abroad for holiday or forever. Um, and generally, if you have gone abroad, then you know it's a good idea for people to come back. And not just during the abroad year. Um, that generally, you know, it should be uh, that you know Russians who left in the 1990s that were part of the demographic crisis. Um, the popular narrative now, one that I've heard over and over and over again, is that people are now coming back because Russia looks after their own, it's funding science, it's funding um, and looking after its own people. People who left in the 1990s were ashamed of the choices they made, so on and so forth. Finally, consumption, especially consumption of Russian goods and Russian brands have become very sort of associated with patriotism. And again, especially since uh, the annexation of Crimea and then the imposition of Western sanctions, um, import substitution has now made Russian brands and Russian products a very patriotic thing, um, although people sometimes struggle to name specifically Russian brands or products. So this is more or less a broad sort of general characterization of official patriotism. What it doesn't tell us is what people actually think. It tells us what the, the state would like people to think, right? But if you actually ask people, which is what I've been doing for the last three years, you get a very different picture. Um, because patriotism, too often we have a tendency to kind of impose our own Western or American templates upon these sorts of things and think what patriotism is. And so for an American citizen who's been born and raised in the United States, you might think of American way of life, you know, apple pie, white picket fences, voting in presidential elections, so on and so forth, right? Um, and usually that political component is crucial to them, right? That an individual bears, a citizen bears a patriotic responsibility to be active in the ongoing contributions to democracy, what have you. In Russia, it's a little bit different. And this is based on interviews that I conducted in two regions, in Perm and Chumen, over the last, uh, last few years, um, as well as a number of focus groups that I conducted. And for most Russians, uh, patriotism has absolutely nothing to do with politics. In fact, Many people said that patriotism is opposed to politics. Politics spoils patriotism. Um, business and profit also spoils patriotism. For most people, patriotism is a combination of very personal and very idealistic kinds of things. When I ask people, you know, what does it mean to be a patriot in Russia today? And that was usually the first question I would ask them. Uh, their first response would be, well, it's obviously to love the motherland. <coughs> well, that's great. What does that mean? Right? How does one love the motherland? What sorts of things do you do to demonstrate one's love to the motherland in your day-to-day -day life? Um, and that was a little bit more tricky. When people start teasing it out, it's a variety of day-to-day -day things that have absolutely nothing to do with politics. It's living, living right, living clean, raising your children right. Um, it's improving one's surroundings by doing things like your job, doing your job correctly, and again, not causing trouble for others, not making noise out on the streets, not shouting, not littering. Um, Consuming Russian products was also something that people named as being sort of one thing that you could do. 
on, uh, in your day-to-day -day life, but again, they often had a difficult time naming actual Russian products that they consumed. Um, and then, of course, choosing not to leave Russia, or at least choosing to stay in Russia. Um, and also, sometimes domestic tourism was featured as sort of being patriotic. And so you see some correspondence there with official narratives. What was interesting, though, is because these things were all associated with love, something that comes from within, had a real emotive or effective tie, right? They're considered authentic ways that one can demonstrate one's patriotism. By contrast, any sort of patriotism that's conduct connected with public politics or with business was really generally described as being more or less inauthentic. It's not connected with love. It's actually very cynical. Um, and and uh, so things that are associated with patriotism as activated from above, public campaigns, parades, what have you, um, these were considered to be, on the one hand, normal, expected, of course the government's supposed to do this, you know, but at the same time also to be essentially nothing more than formulaic, no real emotional connection, no real emotional tie, no really strong meaning. Um, likewise, patriotism that's performed, uh, what people call pakaznoi patriotism or kura uh, patriotism, sort of, again, sort of like the flag-waving sorts of patriotism, uh, was described largely as being mostly uh, irrelevant to one's ordinary sense of patriotism, and in a sense, inauthentic. And so you see there's actually a great deal of daylight between official forms of patriotism, especially the kinds that are dictated through the state patriotic education program, and the ways that Russians understand it in day-to-day -day life. And what you don't see, obviously, here are things like voting, um, or the attempt to sort of influence politics on a day-to-day -day, day -day, uh, um, basis. Instead, it's about more or less sort of, in many ways, turning within, focusing on immediate family, or kinship or friendship relations, right? That's looking after one small island world, you're not looking after your little motherland. Um, the motherland as a whole is very abstract in many ways, almost uh, formless uh, concept for most people. Now, what this suggests is that there may not be a lot of support for official forms of patriotism, but where that starts to break down is when you start talking about people not talking about patriotism with people not in an interview, like on a one-on-one -on -one context, but when you actually start observing social dynamics. Um, and, and putting together some focus groups to talk about uh, patriotism, um, or more specifically talking about love for the motherland, instead what you saw was a clear shift in sort of the balance of discussions, that once people were in a social setting, then they started talking about <coughs> official repertoires. They start talking about official patriotic repertoires. Uh, Putin was not mentioned a single time in any of the interviews. He was mentioned in every focus group as being patriotic. Um, and there are a few things that did repeat, particularly choosing to stay in Russia, consuming Russian goods. Uh, but for the most part, those patriotic practices that were viewed as inauthentic suddenly became construed and accepted by consensus as being authentic. Likewise, if personal patriotism, everyday patriotism, is ambivalent about politics, in a social dynamic, it becomes supportive of regime. And what's perhaps most revealing here, or most interesting to me, is that in the interviews, most people told me that they felt like, a lot of people told me that they felt like they were very much in the minority, while the rest of society was a real patriot in the government sense. Um, and therefore, they, didn't, they had a sense of patriotism, but they didn't consider themselves to be patriots. But in a group setting, everybody becomes a patriot. Um, and th there's an anthropological moment here that I think is worth stressing, um, which is that there is a real difference in the ways that people in Russia use these terms, patriotism and being a patriot. Uh, patriotum, to be a patriot, means that you are loyal to the collective, to the group, right? And sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean direct specifically with regards to the state. You can be a patriot of your you know, street corner if you like, right, or your theater troupe, doesn't really matter. But sort of the, the default modal sort of sense of patriot is being loyal to the state in the same way that if you ask an American what's the first election you voted in, they're going to tell you the first presidential election, never mind that they participated in a endless series of meaningless elections starting from Hall Monitor when they were little, right, it's sort of like one of those default modes of uh, identity activation. And so in this sense, being a patriot activates this sense of loyalty, it activates this sense uh, of embracing official repertoires as something which is our own, and which stands separate from the way that people will privately express their sentiments and what they think patriotism really is, which also conceals a great deal of cynicism about what the government is and what it does. This gap 
between public and private, I think, tells us something essential, which is that uh, there is vast potential for preference falsification going on uh, in Russia, insofar as people have one sense of patriotism uh, that is very personal and very idealistic and very opposed to uh, politics, and a public sense of patriotism, uh, which is expressed only in public settings. Um, one has no political program whatsoever. The other is supportive of the government. One is extremely individualist. The other is collectivist. Now, if you look at Russia's ideological landscape, particularly since Crimea, you can see a couple of things here, which is that, in a broad sense, if we think about organized politics in terms of collectivist or individualist politics and whether they're pro or anti-regime, you have essentially three camps, uh, patriots, nationalists, and liberals. Uh, liberals are everybody's favorite villain, but most significantly, there is no pro-regime individualist camp. Uh, you have, you know, of course, parties like Yabloka, uh, that are still kicking around that aren't able to sort of like tap into the sentiment, but it's not something that's exploited by the government. It's not something that achieves representation within the government or within the regime broadly. And this is a potentially a vast untapped political resource uh, within Russian politics today. But perhaps more interesting is that given the gap between public and private, and given the scale of the state's investment now in patriotism, What's most likely to happen is the state will continue pushing an official patriotic message that this investment will continue. And you start to see also the raising of bureaucratic thresholds for performance evaluation in line with this investment in pure and patriotic education. So now you have concrete, quantitative thresholds for performance in terms of, say, turnouts for mass rallies for political events. On the other hand, as the state pushes this official patriotic message, that's going to only widen the gap between personal and official patriotism. People will feel more and more distant from an increasingly cynical and bureaucratized form of patriotism that poses a threat for a long-term crisis of legitimacy. Um, that's the makings of that are already potentially there. Um, and as one of my respondents told me, yes, of course, patriotism means love for the motherland, but it would be nice if it was mutual. <laughs> so that's uh, more or less where I'm here. I think I'm a little bit over time. So, um, by this point. Oh, but we spent a lot of time on slides. But thank you very much. So my uh, presentation in my memo is about the political and social attitudes of Muslims in Russia. Uh, Russia actually has the largest Muslim population of any European country. Its size is estimated from between 16 and 20 million. It actually has the fourth largest minority Muslim population of any country in the world, following India, Ethiopia, and China. Um, unlike other European countries with uh, significant Muslim populations. Most of Russia's Muslims are actually born in Russia, so they're not immigrants. And uh, it's an interesting question, I think, as the extent to which Russia's Muslims uh, represent a distinct community in terms of their political attitudes, their social perspectives. Um, and, and there's still not much, I would argue, empirical information about this question. So uh, here's a dist regional distribution of Russia's Muslims. About one third live in the North Caucasus. Uh, about 25% a little more live in the, the two Volga regions, uh, Bashkoristan and Tatarstan, and the rest are dispersed elsewhere in the country. Um, he, those are those mainly Muslim regions. Uh, quick geography lesson here, uh, but I won't dwell on this. So uh, why, is, why, why are, are the views of Muslims and whether or not they have distinctive views in Russia, uh, why is that an interesting question? Well, there are a number of reasons. So, as we're all familiar with, uh, the North Caucasus has a recent history of violent insurgency. Um, I think uh, I'm not going to rehearse the history of that, but uh, Russia fought uh, two uh, wars to quell the insurgency. It started out as a sort of nationalistic secessionist movement and converted into a more general Islamist uh, type of, of movement, as um, uh, Katya Stepanova mentioned yesterday. 
Uh, the ultimate solution was one of Chechenization and the, the support for Ramzan Kadyrov, who brought the conflict to an end, essentially, at least in some sense. Uh, but in the meantime, the violence has spread from Chechnya to neighboring republics. Um, interestingly enough, um, the, the violence also uh, in the neighboring republics as well uh, was significantly reduced starting in 2013 uh, for a complex set of reasons that I won't get into. But basically, I think uh, the Russian government, with some Russian government, with some justification, feels that it's been largely successful in uh, <laughs> defeating the, the risk of threat of violent insurgency in the North Caucasus. Um, at the same time, we've seen tensions grow in the Volga regions, uh, which historically have been much more uh, sort of moderate in terms of their the orientations of the Muslims living there. But uh, just as the um, conflict has ebbed in Chechnya. Uh, there's signs of radicalization, and uh, the government has initiated some anti-terrorist operations, so to speak, in Tatarstan, uh, also starting in 2013. Kremlin policy has been dual-sided. Uh, on the one hand, it's uh, sought to crack down on uh, the rebellious or insurgent to radicalize Muslims. At the same time, it's continued a long Russian tradition of trying to incorporate <laughs> Uh, the loyal Muslims, so to speak, and to use Islamic faith as a source of uh, generating support for the regime by emphasizing how uh, Russia has uh, distinctive Islamic traditions, by providing financial support to the officially sanctioned uh, Muslim religious authorities. And this is symbolized by the construction of the large cathedral mosque in September 2015, over which Putin himself presided at the grand opening of the mosque, and Kadyrov was there as well. So the question then is, how well are integrated are Russia's Muslims overall? We know that there are some extremists. There's been controversy over the years as to how, uh, how big a threat that actually is. Some say it's been manufactured and inflated by the government. Others say it's a really major threat and it's to undermine uh, stability in the country. Um, are Muslims a source of support for the Putin regime, or are they a source of stability, or is it neither nor? Um, in this context, Kadyrovism is actually an interesting Phenomena. So we know that Kadyrov has risen to national prominence, and that uh, Kadyrov, his sort of stock and trade, has consisted of hyper loyalty to Putin, like uh, very extreme uh, expressions of devotion to Putin and his cause, which includes also uh, hatred for Putin's enemies and an intent to help Putin to destroy his enemies, um, including using violent means. Um, he's uh, he pacified the territory of Chechnya with brute force. Um, in exchange for money and autonomy from Kremlin. So basically the deal was worked out was that uh, he gets to do what he wants within the Republic so long as he keeps a lid on the Islamic uh, and other secessionist uh, movements. Um, he's also has, uh, is noted for his social and religious conservatism, um, introducing such things as Sharia law, banning alcohol, things like this at various points in time. So in that sense, he's somewhat consistent with the move towards social conservatism in Russian society. Um, and um, he's uh, all, you know, been linked with various assassinations of the regime's political opponents. So the question, I think, is you know, to what extent is just, just Kadyrov being Kadyrov, and he's kind of a, a, a controversial political figure, to what extent does his policies gain support of other uh, of Muslims more generally within uh, Russia? I mean, does he stand out as a figure, uh, not so much him personally, but the sorts of, uh, his sort of approach to political life? Uh, then in the Volga regions, you know, these regions, as noted, they differ historically uh, from the North Caucasus. They've been traditionally better integrated. Um, they, they, there's been limited influence of Salafism, Wahhabism, and other sort of extremist strands of Islam there. Uh, but recently, there have been some signs of extremism I mentioned. So uh, Doku Umarov, the, the uh, radical um, Islamist who is, uh, was, was eventually killed by the Russian authorities, but he released a famous uh, video in 2011 where he called upon the, the Volga Muslims to join his caliphate, to join his struggle, and to help uh, struggle against the, the Russian government. Uh, then there was the assassination of a moderate uh, Muslim mufti, and, and uh, at the same time an attack, which didn't lead to the death of a second uh, official um, in uh, Tatarstan in 2012. And the feds responded, or the Russian federal troops responded with, a crackdown and counterinsurgency in the region. So, the, all this together, I'm, I'm going to say there's th three ways to think about the political views of Muslims in general. One is that they are extremists, that there's broad support 
uh, for the, uh, whatever you want to call it, jihadist um, uh, tendencies, uh, that there's been efforts of foreign uh, organizations to stir up the support. There have been some people, including some people in Washington, I mean, I think of Gordon Hahn, for example, wrote a book called Russia's Islamic Threat, where he anticipated that uh, there would be spiraling radical support for extremism within Russia that could lead to all kinds of dis you know, instability and problems. Then there's a Kadyrovism perspective which suggests that Muslims uh, that might look to somebody at Kadyrov and approve of this type of hyper-loyalty to the regime and see you know, stability coupled with loyalty, coupled with anti-liberal views to be uh, something that they would support. And then there's what I call the Kasha perspective, and that comes from actually an article that Sarah and Middleton and I uh, wrote uh, some time ago, where we, based on some survey data we had from the three North Caucasus republics, we found that actually the, public, the political views of Muslim males anyway in those republics didn't really differ that much from those of Russia. We called it a bowl of Kasha because they were heterogeneous views on a lot of political issues. So those are three broad perspectives. Um, I think I should probably get to the data, but you know, basically, in addition to, there are many, you know, to throw in a few additional reasons why this matters. So with the rise of immigration from Central Asia, and obviously uh, there are some Muslims among the Central Asian migrants, and there's a potential for uh, various Islamic ideas to be imported from Central Asia into Russia that could lead to conflict. With the Syrian conflict, uh, the, the, uh, there have been a number of Russia's Muslims who have been involved in that conflict, the radicals, so part of the reason that the, it's argued that the conflict ebbed in uh, the North Caucasus is many of those folks uh, took off to fight in the Syria campaign, and the ISIS uh, released some videos itself, you know, telling the Russian, uh, Russian radical extremist Muslims, uh, what are you doing eating uh, roots in the forest of Chechnya? You could be out here fighting the glorious fight in, in uh, Syria and Iraq. And, um, and yeah, there have been, you know, terrorism is not, uh, uh, it continues to be a problem in Russia. There have been attacks, so Umar uh, gang most recently has been uh, most famous for or has, has been responsible for some of the greatest attacks. There's also backlash against uh, Chechnya and against uh, immigrants from uh, Islamic countries and, and among Russian nationalists, and the Stop Feeding the Caucasus uh, slogan, for example, symbolizes that. Uh, so there's potential tensions between Russians and, uh, or, or ethnic Russians, so to speak, and Russia's Muslim population. Um, then there's uh, widespread reports of Chechens fighting in Ukraine, uh, both sides, uh, and that they're, so, uh, Battle-hardened uh, uh, cadres moving from Chechnya to, to join in that struggle, um, and then there's uh, continuing issues of federal service. So, so we, I think it's a, fair enough to say it's an interesting question, and surprisingly enough, there's not a lot of data, at least not survey data, that allows us to address that. Part of the reason is that it's uh, still a relatively small population. So, without specific efforts to survey this particular population with an oversample, it's hard to generate a sufficiently large sample to make any broad conclusion. So that's what we did. We, as part of a larger project that uh, my co-author Jane Zabiski and I undertook with support from the Minerva Research Initiative, the larger project looks at housing and uh, social stability in Central Eurasia, and it looks at four countries, and in uh, those four countries. In Russia, we had an oversample of Muslim, or, or we oversampled regions, heavily Muslim regions, precisely in an attempt to generate uh, enough Muslims to do some serious analysis. So we oversampled in Dagestan, Kabardina, Balkaria, Tatarstan, and Bashkortostan, and we have 407 Muslim respondents of our approximately 2,400 overall respondents, 241 of them from the North Caucasus, 105 from the Volga regions, and 61 from other regions. All right? So that's the specific regional breakdown. For the analysis, um, I distinguish three issue areas as dependent variables. Trust in institutions, and I have multiple measures of all these. Trust in institutions, uh, views on social and political issues, and then views on foreign policy or international affairs. And for simplicity, in, e in every case, I dichotomize the dependent variables, so to speak. I dichotomize the measure of attitude. Um, and then I conducted logistic regressions controlling for age, gender, education, and urban versus rural residents, all of which could confound any potential effect of Muslim versus non-Muslims. And the key here is, uh, the key variable of interest is the comparison of North Caucasus Muslims and also other Muslims to non-Muslims. So not just Muslims and non-Muslims, but those two regional distinctions. Um, and I report the results in terms of average marginal effects, which gives you the, the change in the probability of taking a particular um, uh, position that's related to being in the category of interest. So going through the results then, 
In terms of trust of institutions, in trust in institutions, we see that uh, so so the key thing here is that there's a big difference uh, between the differences between Muslims and non-Muslims that are masked if you don't pay attention to the distinction within the Muslim community community between the North Caucasus and elsewhere and other Muslims uh, because those differences tend to offset each other. So uh, here is measures of trust in Putin, uh, also the police, the Duma, the courts, the banks, and the governments. And as you can see, the North Caucasus Muslims are more likely to completely trust Putin, so that's consistent with this Kadyrov super loyalty notion, whereas the other Muslims are less likely to completely trust Putin. Um, and then, however, in contrast, the North Caucasus Muslims are less trusting, tend to be less trusting of other political institutions, whereas the other Muslims are more trusting of other political institutions, quite consistently so. Okay, so that's one example of these sort of offsetting differences, and these are all relative to non-Muslims in Russia, okay? Moving on to political and social issues, so we asked about a, a broad range of questions. Um, generally, all Muslims are more supportive of free and fair elections, and they're also, interestingly enough, less intolerant of other religions. So, um, it's, so that, what that suggests is that non-Muslims, uh, that, that question is, or, or would you be willing to have a neighbor uh, with a different religion as you? Okay, and the, the Muslims are less likely to say they don't want a neighbor with a different religion than non-Muslims are, implying that non-Muslims are probably less likely to want a Muslim neighbor than vice versa. Um, also, interestingly enough, both groups of Muslims uh, are, are unlikely to say that Russians and, and Muslims don't get along well in their locality or their region. Okay, but apart from that, there are different patterns between the two groups. Uh, that there's some tendency, this is a bit mild, uh, and it doesn't pertain to all variables, but there's some tendency for other Muslims to be more liberal. So they're more supportive of uh, a strong opposition, they're more supportive of freedom of assembly, and they're less likely to want more government control of the, over the internet, and they're also likely to support protests in general. Whereas the North Caucasus Muslims, uh, they're more opposed to foreign funding of NGOs, more supportive of the infamous foreign agent law. Uh, and they also are more uh, opposed to having a homosexual as neighbor. So the, these, you know, the, these contrasts uh, um, are kind of interesting. By and large, they conform to the to the the general pattern is of mild support for liberal ideas among other Muslims, and mild uh, or more support for Putinist ideas among the North Caucasus Muslims. Finally, uh, foreign policy, international affairs. So here, the pattern is quite straight, quite clear, uh, with with respect to just about uh, every. Variable. So we, we, I guess it's really captured by these views of, of the Ukraine conflict and of the specific country's relationships to Russia. So uh, North Caucasus Muslims are more supportive of providing support to the separatists, and, uh, blame, and they're more likely to say the United States is to blame for the conflict in Ukraine, is the main party to blame, whereas the other Muslims are less likely to take both of those positions. And by and large, the North Caucasus Muslims, they, they see Iran as a partner of Russia, they see Ukraine as an enemy, uh, they see, they don't see Germany as a partner, they see uh, Georgia as an enemy, whereas the opposite holds for the uh, other Muslims. So, to conclude, uh, the political views of Russia's Muslims, they are distinct from the views of non-Muslims in Russia, but there are important and offsetting regional variations in that distinction, which if you don't attend to that, then it looks like Muslims are, you know, a bowl of kasha, they're just like uh, uh, Russians. So it's very important, and, you know, I won't review their findings, uh, which I just went through, but uh, the, you know, by and large, the North Caucasus Muslims conform to this, uh, the image of this Kadyrovist uh, sentiment applies to the North Caucasus Muslims. It doesn't apply so much to the Volga and other Muslims who tend to be slightly more critical of the regime on the basis of liberal, not extremist, jihadist ideas. Um, and uh, overall, I mean, I think the lesson is that we need to be much more careful in studying Russia's Muslims. We should get more data. We should uh, uh, try to understand even uh, other sources of variation apart from this regional distinction. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll be um, speaking. Whoops, I'll be speaking mostly from here. Although I will go off at one point because I want to show a chart. The um, presentation that I'll be giving in the memo is uh, or based on um, public opinion polling that uh, the Levada Center has conducted for me for the last 10 years, um, starting in 2006 and continuing to this year. There, there actually is a round um, that has occurred this month. I was worried 
initially given the recent um, extremely unfortunate turmoil with the Levada Center that um, it wouldn't be conducted, but in fact it was. I haven't looked at the data yet. I was hoping to um, receive the data prior to the seminar, but I haven't received. They're still um, sifting through it. So the, um, uh, but I, I, we have had two rounds each year. The Levada Center has um, long, going back to the early 19, really about 1994, been, or even 93, been asking Russian, the Russian population about um, Chechnya and, and the North Caucasus as a, as a whole, but particularly about Chechnya. Um, but what I have had them do over the last 10 years is to have add-on questions for me. And they also have conducted um, surveys in Chechnya itself, but I'm not going to be talking about the ones in Chechnya. It's in some ways a companion to um, to Ted's talk. The um, Ted talk, that's <laughs> great. It's, um, Ted, Ted's uh, presentation. Um, the uh, uh, so, but I am going to be talking about the ones um, in Russia as a whole, and um, particularly about a uh, a very interesting sort of. Um, trend over the last uh, two to three years, um, where it, um, it was a very striking change in Russian sentiment about uh, Chechnya um, in 2014, and um, I will discuss that, and then this year there's been a reversal of that. So I'm going to, um, and uh, the questions that I had them ask, because doing it twice a year allows me to have questions that are partly in response to the initial round of survey. So the ones that I have, um, will have for September of this year are in part to understand better the reasons for the reversal this year. I, I think I can explain um, pretty well the reason that this um, change happened in 2014. But the um, surveys of public opinion about uh, the status of Chechnya um, indicate that a growing majority of Russians, particularly this year, view the situation as tense and unstable and don't believe it will improve anytime soon. And that might not sound like a profound thing, except to say that that marks a real reversal of sentiment in the previous two years. Um, it, one thing, there are two aspects of Russian uh, opinion that haven't changed over the last couple of years. In fact, they've remained relatively stable over the last 15 years. One is that a sizable percentage, um, either a plurality or a majority of Russians, have been willing to have Chechnya become independent, which is clearly not something the Russian government, um, especially over the last 15, uh, 16 years, would um, be willing to contemplate. But, um, but also views of Kadyrov, and I, I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, the views of the Russian population, and this again is a very interesting companion to what Ted found, but um, the views of the Russian population, though, of Kadyrov are very positive. Um, so I will come back to that. Um, the, uh, the, the reason that I think, again, some of these changes are important, um, let me, I hope to have more time to um, to get into them as a, uh, to get into these factors, but let me just mention them briefly now, and then I'll come to the opinion. Is first of all, um, Kadyrov himself was um, elected to a th uh, third term, which in, in principle isn't fully in keeping with the constitution, but his office was renamed instead of a president, the head of of Chechnya, so that makes it constitutional. Um, the, uh, um, he was acting head from the time his term had, when it expired in the spring until um, the election uh, last week. And he, um, he uh, initially wasn't sure that Putin would keep him on because he thought that Putin right away would come out in support of him. And it took much longer, I think, than than Kadyrov anticipated. I think from Putin's perspective, that was actually quite an effective tactic. It made very clear um, to Kadyrov that uh, he still, despite his efforts to attain great autonomy in Chechnya, um, he still is uh, ultimately dependent on Putin's good graces. 
The um, second factor that I think um, is, makes this important to look at is that, uh, that Ted alluded to this, the large number of Chechens who have gone to fight for Islamic State. Um, there is some prospect, again, quite a few of them have been killed, but, um, but there is some prospect that eventually they will return. Um, so there, were, there was a terrorist attack carried out um, a few months ago in Turkey by Chechens. The, um, uh, and there is the prospect that that will happen um, as well in Chechnya. I'll come back to that if I have time. The, um, there is also, particularly with the restructure, a third factor is the restructuring of the security forces in Russia um, that is still underway. It uh, began with the announcement of the formation of the National Guard in April and then uh, has continued with at least recent reports as yet, I believe, not officially confirmed, but certainly haven't been denied either that there will be a wholesale restructuring into a new Ministry of State Security that will basically reestablish the elements that the KGB had under its control in, in, uh, during most of the post-1954 um, era after it was formed. The, um, um, and then finally one factor that again makes this important is the prolonged economic uh, hardships in Russia and have been particularly acute in Chechnya, although Chechnya um, does receive <coughs> extra funding within the North Caucasus, and that has been the case since 2007, and it continues to be the case today. So the economic situation is not quite as bleak in Chechnya as it is in the rest of the North Caucasus, and in many respects. Um, elsewhere in uh, Russia, but it um, is still something where at least the surveys show that, the, the surveys within Chechnya show that there is um, growing discontent about it. So let me turn quickly to look at the, then to uh, look at the data about public opinion. Um, it, the uh, Russian public um, rarely focuses on the North Caucasus. I should add that, that it is not a major topic of uh, concern for most Russians, particularly with the ending of fighting there. Um, yeah, that, I'm going to come back to that. Actually, I was going to wait, but I'll, uh, um, to the extent that Chechnya does come to public attention outside the North Caucasus. It is either because Chechen extremists have carried out a terrorist attack or because Ramzan Kadyrov has made some outrageous comment or other or murdered one of his opponents um, in, in um, numerous cases in Moscow uh, as well as outside Russia and certainly within um, the North Caucasus. The, um, from the Russian government's perspective, and it's always best when Chechnya remains safely out of the public limelight, and by and large, it has. And that's why I just want to look at um, these changes. From the early 1990s, going back to the start of the Levada Center's polling through 2014, the Russian public viewed the North Caucasus as a re region of danger, instability, and terrorism. Um, so basically, for about <coughs> excuse me, um, 20 odd years, there was a pretty consistent view of the North Caucasus that basically saw it as a region that um, was pretty hopeless, um, the, uh, but particularly at Chechnya. Um, from the 1990s through the end of 2013, only 10 to 15 percent of Russians believe that the situation in the North Caucasus was favorable or calm. Or calm. Um, whereas roughly 80% believed it was tense or dangerously explosive. And more, uh, those are phrases used in the questions. More than 80% of Russians in 2013 expressed, concern, quote, concern about the spread of terrorism from the North Caucasus. But um, the, uh, there was a major change in 2014 that came on, and um, I had hesitated about showing a chart because I was hoping to have the data from uh, the, this month's run of the polling to show. So it, uh, even though I'm not going to show it in a chart, let me uh, quickly summarize it. So bear in mind that about 80, 80 sometimes 85 percent would see the North Caucasus as favorable, or, or, or I'm sorry, as uh, tense or dangerously explosive, and would be concerned about 
the spread of terrorism. In, um, in the spring of 2014, just a couple of months after Putin announced the annexation of Crimea, Russian public attitudes regarding the situation in Chechnya became much more positive and relaxed than in previous years. Um, according to surveys in May 2014, the percentage of Russians who uh, deem the situation in the North Caucasus um, as favorable or calm, sorry, I'm originally from Boston, um, had, uh, had risen to 45%, up from 10%, suddenly in the space of about um, seven months had risen to 45%. And the percentage of those who saw it as tense or dangerously explosive had dropped from about 82% down to 43%. Um, the percentage of Russians who expressed concern about the spread of terrorism from the North Caucasus dropped by uh, a similar percentage, by uh, about 30%. So those remarkable changes of sentiment in the spring of 2014 prompted me to add a question in September of 2014 about what lay behind this. And Ted alluded to this already, but in, uh, I was wondering, for example, was it that people were looking at um, the uh, actual trends in violence in the region? You can see that, particularly in Dagestan, which accounts for um, the large bulk of the violence in recent years. That uh, Chechnya you know, has been considerably Oops, okay, I'll uh, move a little bit more quickly. Is um, the, uh, that there are really only four parts of the North Caucasus that account for any significant percentage of violence. Those would be Dagestan, Ingushetia, uh, Chechnya, and Kabardina Baltaria. Um, but the trend, basically, which Ted described, you know, has basically been downward in all, but the sharpest decline by far has been in Dagestan. So I was wondering, maybe it was because of that, that um, people, it, it still didn't seem plausible to me, though, that that would account for this sudden change of sentiment after 20 odd years. To have those kinds of reversals is hard to explain simply by looking at trends, because, for example, after the end of the war in uh, Chechnya in 2009 and the end of um, any major fighting several years before that, the, um, there hadn't been much change. There was some, but it was gradual and not very sharp. Um, so basically, I guess I'm uh, running somewhat uh, a little bit behind, but I will try to finish quickly, is um, that what uh, the follow-on question showed is that it really didn't have much to do with this. In fact, most people hadn't really been aware of this. Um, they were vaguely aware in some cases, but um, most respondents didn't even indicate any knowledge that, uh, for example, violence had sharply decreased in Dagestan. Um, instead, what it had to do were attitudes brought on by the annexation of Crimea. And um, this goes, I guess, a little to Paul's talk, is the surge of patriotic sentiment. And particularly, respondents would talk about that Russia had demonstrated its ability to deal with potential enemies. Um, so the, uh, it was an odd situation in which sentiment about Chechnya had suddenly been affected by something that was almost completely irrelevant um, to it. And um, so let me just uh, quickly say, if I can, um, is, uh, I guess I'm over, am I over? Okay, just, the, uh, just two, two more minutes. Is, um, <laughs> the, uh, that um, uh, situation remained the case in 2015. That basically the same sort of sentiment that you saw in 2014, that abrupt change, persisted through 2015. In, um, the, in uh, May of this year, the first round that the Levada Center did for me um, showed that, in fact, sentiment had turned around again. Um, it hadn't returned to where it was, say, in 2013, but it was, you know, the views were much more negative about Chechnya and about the North Caucasus than they had been. Um, much closer to where they had been in 2013. 
Um, and so uh, the questions I had them ask in this latest round, which I haven't received yet, but um, was trying to understand why that was. And, and basically, my preliminary explanation of it would be, which I'll have to present very quickly, is um, that uh, it is because the patriotism effect that Paul was talking about, about the annexation of Crimea, has reached its um, expiration date, that um, it isn't having that uh, same resonance. It, it, maybe it isn't the expiration date yet, but it's rapidly approaching, is that um, it isn't having the same resonance in generating the way people think about Chechnya and other issues that it did say in 2014 and 2015. Thank you. our today's discussion by exploring what will be happening next year with the 1917 commemoration in Russia. As you know, in a few months, Russia will enter a rich and complex series of remembrances for the 100th anniversary of 1917. It will have to find a way to commemorate the collapse of the Tsarist regime, the February Revolution, and the provisional government, and then the Bolshevik revolution. And as you know, everything symbolic related to celebrating Russian past and the Russian state is important for the regime and for the way the regime is dialoguing with the society. But of course, the 1917 celebration are kind of difficult for the regime for several reasons. The first one is that it's not easy for a regime that wants to embody status quo, stability, and conservatism to find the right narrative to say something about revolutions. If you consider that revolutions are bringing chaos, violence, and instability, you should find a way to say something about them. The second uh, difficulty is that it's easier to celebrate Russia at the peak of its power and influence, for example, at the winner of the Second World War, than to celebrate Leninist Russia, Russia of the Bolshevik Revolution. And as you know, the regime has been kind of having difficulties managing what he wants to say about early Soviet time. The Bolshevik figure leaders are usually not celebrated. Figures in contemporary Russia, at the same time, the regime is not really interested in reopening the discussion about removing Lenin from the Red Square because it's also symbolizing state power. So it's a kind of difficult negotiation. And the third and key element is that the regime doesn't want to have to make a choice between those who are celebrating the Tsarist regime and the imperial family and those who want to celebrate Soviet Russia. And the regime is not interested in crafting a kind of unique and rigidified historical narrative that would create tensions or discussions among the population and among the elites. He wants something that is implicit, blurry, plastic historical narrative so everybody can read whatever he wants in uh, the Russian history. So one way to celebrate or to prepare for the, the celebration of uh, uh, this year is uh, the example I would like to discuss here is the narrative that has been uh, uh, already presented in this new historical park exhibition, Rasia Maya Historia, that you can see at VDNH. It opened last year, and I will really invite you to visit it. It's really an impressive uh, work. So the exhibition, you need almost a full day to do everything. The, the exhibition is divided in three exhibitions. The first one is devoted to the first Russian dynasty, the Ryuliki. The second one to the Romanov, and then you don't see it here. The third one is devoted to the history of the Soviet Union. It's stopping for the moment in 1945, but this December they will be bringing the second half of the century. So if you go next year, you will be able to see everything from prehistory to Putin. It's a very visual exhibition. It's targeting school-age children, parents. It's really not a museum. It has no artifact. It's about popular <laughs> culture and how to bring history to the population. It's in inspired by video game cultures and aesthetics. And of course, it's a relatively powerful way of presenting Russian history. There are permanent parallels between historical times and contemporary meanings thanks to several uh, uh, quotations that you can find about from the main Russian historian and from the main Russian politicians. 
The church is everywhere in the three exhibitions, and in fact, this exhibition has been largely funded by the Moscow Patriarchate, by Father Tichon, and the second main funder of this exhibition is the Moscow Municipality, which has always been, since Lushkov, very much linked to uh, the Russian Patriarchate. What is also interesting is that each historical period is discussed in terms of its territoriality, so each time you can see if it if Russia win or lose some territory, so it's classified by territory. And then you have a very easy to interpret color code. When it's green, it's good for Russia. When it's red, it's bad for Russia. <laughs> so what we see in terms of discussing the 1917 is that the destruction of the imperial family is considered, of the imperial Russia is considered as a drama. And clearly the Tsarist regime is very openly rehabilitated at the end of the Romanov exhibition. There are several documentary films about the martyrdom of the imperial family. And then the main kind of magic trick for, to, for preparing the commemoration next year and find a way to reconcile, reconcile the two uh, narrative about uh, uh, what happened in 1917, it's to explain that it's not the Bolshevik who destroyed Tsarist Russia, it's the February Revolution. And the February Revolution was supported by the West and shaped by Western liberal values. So what this exhibition is explaining is that there was no conflict between two Russia, a white and a red, but a fight between Russia and the West. And so the exhibition explained how the collapse of the Tsarist regime was not due to domestic issues, but should be seen as part of a geopolitical strategy of reorganizing Europe. And so at the end of the Romanov exhibition, you have a really huge, totally disproportionate section devoted to the First World War and to the February Revolution and to their connection abroad that really allowed to create a kind of buffer time from moving from the Tsarist regime to the Soviet regime. So you don't feel that one is in contradiction with the other, with the other because in the middle you had this huge section on the February Revolution. And there are also many small kind of short documentary films to watch that make explicit parallel between the February Revolution and the contemporary color revolution. And it's even explicitly said that the February Revolution was the first color revolution that Russia had to face. <laughs> the US are identified as the main enemy, that's obvious. So what this exhibition is trying to tell us is that Soviet Russia is not responsible for the collapse of the Soviet of the Tsarist regime. And in fact, as you can see, early Soviet Russia, 1921, is already in green. So even in Bolshevik leaders can be identified as negative because they were revolutionary uh, um, uh, oriented people. What they have been doing for Russia is good because they have been bringing the state back after the, the revolution. Another important element that I think is very successful on the Soviet part, of Soviet Union moment of this exhibition is that it's able to bring a relatively balanced way of looking at the Soviet Union so everybody can find whatever he wants to read in, in for Soviet time. We see a new color emerging for the Soviet time, which is this deep blue, and so my interpretation of the deep blue is that it's better than the red, and that it's better than the red because it's what Soviet Union brought to world civilization. Everything which is related to Soviet society, Soviet culture, economic progress, industrialization, Soviet state science, everything is blue. So it's the fundamental contemporary Russia is built is blue. But then once you move in the Stalin's time, suddenly things are red again and not green. So you can see it's blue and then beginning 1937, it's red. So Stalin regime is red, the Gulag is red, and of course the Second World War are red. So clearly you can see the mark of the church in this historical narrative. It has nothing to do with any kind of pro-Stalin narrative. On the contrary, it's a very critical one. 